destruction mingling. And when we talk to those people who had, were feeling uncomfortable or had left, from either side of that great theological divide, what we discovered was they had a, they had a lot in common with each other. I think we're seeing this kind of um, cross-pollination or converging is happening um, all across human experience. So it isn't just happening in Christian um, or in faith uh, circles, but it's happening, you know, faith encountering science, faith encountering philosophy, faith encountering healthcare, um, you know, and so we're we're seeing conversations that are happening that, that in previous generations I think would have been um, pretty threatening to folks. And now there are new openings, new spots for people to connect. And so we've spent many, many years and lots and lots of ink spilt on the death of Christ. And I wonder if we begin to think about not only mortality, but also natality and the birth of Christ and the fertility of, of our faith. Um, would we not uh, be a much more generative and life-giving sort of faith? To me, a Convergence is about gift sharing across uh, people who used to consider themselves enemies, and even the insight that while they were still in the state of being enemies, like before they left, before they had any problems with where they were, they were still bearing gifts that would later become essential to moving Christianity forward. Good evening. I'm Chris Alexander, your host for Darkwood Brew. Thanks for joining us tonight as we enter into our third conversation on convergence. What's so great about it? We've been asking a lot of people about what they think about this conversation that is now open up to cross disciplines and cross ministries and cross political and theological divides. We have had Carol Howard Merritt here talking to us about being reborn. We have had Cameron Trimble with us talking to us about how Convergence works with denominations and starting new churches and just getting the thought out there and getting people to talk about it. Today we get to uh, converse with Reverend Bruce Van Blair, who is a long-term friend of Eric Elness. So together we're going to have a conversation about vocation and calling and how that intersects with the Convergence conversation. So stay with us as we have our continuing conversation of Convergence. Welcome, nice. Reverend Bruce Van Blair is here with us tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my delight. You're Thank actually you. in the room with us, which will <laughs> ha help our conversation quite a bit. And Eric Elness, you are helping us uh, introduce this whole idea of convergence and talk about how it converses with uh, some mainline denominations, some post-evangelical conversations, and how they are combined together. Now, you two have been great friends for quite a long time, right? Yeah, more than just friends, actually. Uh, uh, Bruce was uh, my pastor back in high school days and then became a pastoral mentor in my uh, early days. And, and just we've continued kind of this weird mix of friendship, collegiality, mentorship, and just uh, kind of 
evolved. I don't know. What are we now? <laughs> We're just good friends who work together now. <laughs> and now you actually work Not all Christians together. hate each other. That's right. That's right. Yeah. See the Christians, how they love one another, right? Yeah, that's right. Wonderful. But if anything I ever say pisses you off, it's it's his fault. I probably learned it from him. That's, oh, that's, good. That's, really oh, that's good. good to know. No doubt. <laughs> and now you're in the room, so we can fully blame you. That's yeah. good. Well, you are working with Countryside Community Church now in a new ministry of uh, as Minister of Lay Ministry, right? And you are partnering with... I'm partnering. You're partnering with a Everybody BTS I can. Center? Oh, yes. Yeah? And, and they are from... And, and the new church in Countryside are now in some kind of liaison, but we don't know what it is yet. Cahoots, as we yeah, call it, cahoots, right? Cahoots, right. Yeah. Well, I hope that you'll tell us a little bit more about the, what that ministry looks like. But specifically, I know that you have um, a lot of interesting thoughts on what vocation is, what calling is. And we have chosen a scripture tonight to speak to that particular uh, concept. So I'm hoping that you'll read us that scripture tonight. It comes from Ephesians 4. Yes. Great. Now? Good. Now. I, therefore, a prisoner in the Lord beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some waitresses, some physicists or engineers, some naturalists or trash collectors, supporting the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Wonderful. Thank you. So this idea of a calling is mentioned in Ephesians. Yeah. We call that vocation sometimes, yes? Yes. Can you tell us what you think of when you hear those phrases? I think that they're far more basic and familiar than we at first realize. I think we get very excited when we start to get an inkling of what God is about, what God is trying to bring into being. And uh, then when we feel like maybe we are a part of it, it gets even more exciting. I think Paul is so excited he can hardly contain himself in starting in the first chapter of Ephesians as he realizes what he calls the great secret that God is bringing all things together in unity, I think his word for convergence, mm -hmm. yes? Yeah. <laughs> right. So how <clears throat> does vocation speak to who we are both spiritually or how we worship together or who we are as opposed to anyone else who uh, is out there working their positions, their jobs? Yeah. How, does, how does vocation speak to both of us? Well, I don't know about women because women have a different kind of ability of just being. But if you have a man who doesn't know that there's anything to do, he's lost. He feels worthless, useless, and nothing makes any sense. So vocation, I think, is our, is our what fancy word from vocal cord to say, from the very beginning, Christians have realized that God had ideas of who they were and what they could be accomplishing, and that's what we call a calling, vocal cord, vocation. I mean, the whole ancient world knew that a vocation was from God. Well, I would venture to guess that women probably have the same issue. Good, <laughs> but I needed you to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's true this week, that's for sure. Um, now, last week we had a conversation in our worship planning group, and you said, I quoted you, so we get this. Spirit doesn't break our free will or strong arm us, but we are in a creation that we didn't choose and are constantly influenced by it. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, I deeply believe that, that God does not straight arm or, or force. It, it, it would lose all meaning, I think, if the free will factor was not in there. 
we would simply be robots. So unbelievably patient, I mean, hard for us to even fathom it, God waits for us to wake up, grow up, catch on, and want to cooperate. Hmm. And I think God will, from all things indicated, allow almost any amount of suffering to, to happen rather than force us to do what we're supposed to do. But there is a certain weightedness about the calling in the world, right? God, the arc bent towards justice and all that. That weightedness of calling and God's calling each individual person. Weighted? A heavy. weightedness, yeah. Is there a, even though God doesn't strong arm us, mm -hmm. is there a weightedness kind of sort of toward well, I, the calling? I think, if, I think I feel weight when I see the suffering when I see what's going on and what it's costing people I care about, maybe that's what you mean by weightedness. Yeah, I mean, you can't walk here for very long without getting concerns for all of the damage going on. Hmm. Yeah. Now, Eric, in this understanding of vocation, how would you say that, that that convergence Christianity speaks of the same idea of vocation or calling? Yeah, well, and on the weightedness thing, I think maybe there was a misunderstanding. I think that the what, what Bruce is trying to say is that God does not force us into our calling. I mean, we are all called towards heavily weighted good and just things. Uh, although we, uh, although I would hesitate to put a very uh, hard definition about what kind of vocation is good, you know, like uh, is an auto mechanics vocation lower than a pediatric cardiologist? Is that lower than a minister's? I mean, we all, what is good is that which brings us fully alive in this world, the way that God has created us to be. But God does not strong arm us into following a calling that actually does bring us fully alive. If we want to just you know, pull back and say, hey, I'd rather be like half alive, God will let us be half alive clear until we're dead. <laughs> uh, so there is no uh, uh, strong arming in that, in that sense. But in why all this has to something to do with convergence um, it, it, on, it operates on a number of level. One is that what's going on presently seems to be a very strong um, energetic pull from the Holy Spirit. Uh, now people will have different language about that. They'll call it different things. But uh, as far as I can tell, uh, we are starting to revolve around a sense of call from the Spirit very strongly within at the grassroots in Christianity. And, and whenever the Spirit calls or you, know, you get in, in any kind of connection with the Spirit, there's always a calling. Uh, anytime you uh, become aware of God's presence and majesty and, and, and the relationship God seeks to have with us, there's always a, a call to that. Um, and usually the sign of that call is that we, it, it, it lights us up. It, 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 we, we feel um, most fully alive when we're acting you know, in, in that calling, either vocationally or as an avocation, what have you. It's, it allows us to channel our love to the world. And within, in terms of convergence, like you know, one of the ways we talk about convergence, uh, it's just a small way uh, uh, amongst the larger convergence is going on, but when you look at what's happened in the evangelical and mainline liberal world, these people who have kind of gone out, left their home bases and gone out into the wilderness saying, my home base doesn't, isn't working for me anymore, and when they meet up in the wilderness and, and start to share gifts, um, you can describe what's, this, what's happening in terms of um, uh, kind of this gift sharing, that, that in the more fundamentalist or, or uh, uh, classically evangelical church, there's for a long time been an appreciation that your vocation is supposed to be a ministry. People have known that for a long time and they've developed very sophisticated ways of, of understanding you know, that an auto mechanic is, has a ministry, for instance, and a, and a pediatric cardiologist and, and so forth. The difference comes in is that that ministry has normally been seen as, a, uh, as useful for converting people to, to Jesus, you know, for pre using your position to then preach Jesus to whoever you're interacting with. Uh, from the, the mainline side, we have had less emphasis on your vocation as, as a calling. We always should have had that, <laughs> but we haven't. Uh, but there has been a, a great deal of attention towards treating people uh, with respect and, and helping them regardless of, of faith commitments. You're not preaching at them, but simply uh, you know, they started great hospitals, for instance, not re you know, with no preaching involved, just healing people, things like that. And in this new convergence mode, both sides are kind of looking at each other and realizing, oh, wait a minute, the, the, the central to our calling is that our life is a ministry. 
Uh, but what we're doing is not simply preaching Jesus. The, the, the focus is treating people like they're Jesus. There's an uh, experience I had long ago on Mercer Island that actually uh, came through this person here. <laughs> Uh, that you know, there was an automotive shop um, where I where I grew up, uh, where Bruce was serving, called Simba's Automotive, and Simba's was that uh, one of those places where if you brought your car in uh, to be fixed, they treated your car and you with such a high degree of respect, veering on reverence, that you almost wanted your car to be sick just to take it in and experience the Simba's treatment. In fact, just about six months ago, I was checking out on the internet, is Simba still there? And it still is. It's now in Redmond, Washington, but all the Yelp reviews were five star. And we literally had people writing in saying, I brought my car in to fix one thing. They fixed that and another thing for free. When I asked why, they said, it just needed to be done. You know, that's Simba's. Well, years ago, uh, a, a friend of mine, um, and I'll reveal that that friend was this guy, <laughs> was Bruce, uh, asked uh, one of the, the two brothers who owned the the, the place say, what is it that I makes mean, yeah, yeah you, what who, what does it make you guys tick and that the, 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 the gentleman said well my brother and I are Muslim and we treat every automobile as if Muhammad himself were to drive away in it you know, you know, that's that's ministry and when we look at Christianity that's what we should be doing treating anybody's call that uh, f helping people find that call and then treating it as just as sacred as any ministers or bishops or what have you and taking that seriously as a church, actually considering like if, if you're an auto mechanic and that's how you, you, you uh, channel your love or you're a pediatric cardiologist, that like at Countryside Church, my church, your church, <laughs> our church, uh, that, that, that we have a ministry in pediatric cardiology or in auto mechanics. And so coming alongside you to then help you reflect theologically on what does that mean that you have a ministry in this area. So uh, for instance, that pediatric cardiologist might be saying, well, now I'm not just simply going to, to, to look at this person as defined by their disease. If that person was Jesus, I'd be saying, well, okay, this is Jesus with a disease, not simply this is the patient. You know, so I might be seeing this person as more of a whole person. I might also be asking, well, how, not only how am I treating this person, but how, how about the hospital this person st has stepped into? Is Jesus being served best in this hospital system? What about this healthcare system? If Jesus were a, a pediatric uh, cardiology patient, um, would this be the best health care system? So it starts getting you to think at, you know, about these people in, in 360 degree views and it brings justice to the forefront of things so that, for instance, we're talking a lot about health care these days in the, in the country. Um, you know, the classic model of ministry, and this is where convergence really turns ministry on its head and that's what we're working on with the BTS Center at, in, uh, in, ba in Portland, Maine. Uh, it, it really means that, you know, the classic model was that the thought was, well, the minister reads the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in another and comes up with thoughts about how society should be going to put the two together and preaches it to their congregation. Their congregation just accepts it like, like lambs and, and goes off and does the good work. You know, well, that model was probably bankrupt from the start, uh, but, but certainly is bankrupt uh, now. Um, if you want to get me to talk about health care policy, I've quite strong views about that, but I also recognize that my highest training in healthcare is my first aid merit badge in Boy Scouts. So, and yet, yet we have tons of people in healthcare in our congregation who have, know far more about the issues involved than I do. So, you, you know, I can talk all day long about how we might envision people as Jesus, but when it comes to specific policies, I don't even want to hear about, from Eric Elness on that in terms of expert <laughs> advice. I want to hear from the pediatric cardiologist. And I don't want to hear from just every single one. I want to hear from the ones who are honestly trying to treat their patients as if they were the founders of whatever religion they happen to be you know, following. Those are the people I want to reflect and tell me about, about health care. So this is not just a Christian thing. This is uh, cross-denomination, cross-culture, cross-discipline kind of idea. Well, convergence, for calling. Yeah, well, convergence certainly is happening across, across faiths, but when we're talking about it here, we're really talking about what's the effect on Christianity right now. And part of the effect in terms of vocatio or calling is it's really turning ministry on its head. It's really seeing that the lay people are at the front lines of ministry in the world. And the ministers are then are meant to empower the lay people to be that front line through helping them reflect theologically on where they, their sweet spot is or their, their calling. And if they don't sense a calling, to help them find it and then act on it. So Bruce, how does Ephesians speak to this notion of convergence? 
does it does it seem to undergird it and support it in the sense that all folks, no matter whether they're in ministry, in the sub traditional church views of ministry versus how they are, relate to the world through justice, through vocation, through their own calling in the world, their own career choices. How does Ephesians speak to that? Well, that's a lot to speak to, first of all, but uh, Paul has, a, has his own mindset and it's a long time ago, so he is only tumbling to a small piece, perhaps, of what we would think of as convergence as he sees that God cares about both Gentiles and Jews. I mean, that's the mind-blowing convergence he's really most excited about. But he realizes, uh, because of his experience, which we probably will just assume we all know, he assumes that God suddenly is calling Gentiles, which wouldn't really normally be a Jewish perspective at that time. So we would take it, Ephesians, from there and say, Yes, God isn't just calling Christians, God is calling all of God's children and trying to build them all into the plan, the perspective that God has been after from the beginning. And that's where Paul's excited about the secret that God is starting to reveal that all things, and he says so point blank, will be drawn into the unity. He thinks in Christ, but that's bigger than just Jesus to him too. Yeah. So how does your uh, work with the BTS Center start to get at this question of how ministry is being reborn in the church? Well, at this point in time, I think we're more reacting still to what we see uh, going on in the church that is not working. And so we are excited about finding new ways of ministry, both lay and clergy, across the board that maybe will help a brand new church with different awarenesses and different understandings come together and move forward in uh, whatever the future is. Yeah. So last week we had <laughs> Carol Howard Merritt on the show and she was talking about um, uh, the Bible verse from John 3 that's, that speaks to how we don't know where the Spirit is coming from or where it's going. And if calling is a uh, part of where it comes from a conversion experience with God and the Spirit or speaking with the Spirit or interacting with the Spirit, then how do we intentionally start to look at our own callings? How can we discern that or see whether it's real for us or where it's pulling us? How, how would we do that and where does the BTS Center kind of lay ministry work play into that? Well, you're asking, again, some questions we can't answer. I, mean, I don't know where BTS is coming from, really. I have some hopes, and they, and they do, too. No question about it. But, but let's back up a little bit. Humans, I think, are always eager to jump in and help too much. We're always eager to get in and do the designing instead of letting God do the designing. I think the, the, the problem with being religious and spiritual is that we always have to slow down and say, wait a minute, who do I trust? And it isn't me. So, for instance, all my life I've been hearing people say, in honest moments, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, usually in, you know, in the office or having a cup of coffee, they said, you know, I could hear, I knew I could hear God calling me since I was a little kid, but I wouldn't listen. And now, 40 years later, I'm finally realizing that I knew, but I wouldn't admit it. I still had the bit in my teeth, as we used to say. Hmm. So, you know, a lot of it, I believe, is a, a dawning awareness of, of spiritual trust, where we back up and say, okay, I've tried it my way long enough. Now, I really am going to try to be receptive and let God guide my life. I mean, I can remember when, uh, when Eric was hearing the call, but he wasn't going to respond because he had too many good ideas of what he's going to do with his life. And, and what were some of those ideas? <laughs> <laughs> Still got a lot of ideas <laughs> when I grow up, yeah. When you grow up, you want to be... Actually, I want to be exactly what I am. Uh, I th actually, I think that's one of the signs of, of a call. You kind of ask, you can do your... You know, kind of that, you kind of feel out these things. Uh, you know, if you won the lottery, for instance, would you drop everything and do something else? Well, 
Okay, well, if, if you would, then either you're probably not into your calling or you're not engaged enough with what you're doing <laughs> to, to, to actually see the callingness uh, w within it. Uh, so you know, to me, it's about um, finding what truly, um, you know, where your work becomes almost, you start thinking of it as play um, as much as, you know, I mean, it's not to say it's never hard, but even the, the, the hardness of it uh, is, is not an issue because your so your soul is connected to your your work rather than just simply it's it's not simply a way of making money. Well, the the idea of the question of spiritual practice, for instance, when we talk about doing spiritual practices, opening ourselves up to listening to God's voice in our lives, where does that come into play in vocation? Is it our way of finding what it is God is calling us to do, or do we just recognize what's already there? How does spiritual practice play into that? Anyone? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Take a shot. <laughs> I, I, I just think of, uh, of the evidence I have of how do we go out usually. I mean, a person starts to think, uh, you know, how can I get a job that will pay me good money and how can I design my life in and how can I become valuable so that people will pay me well and, and, and that whole scenario of rationally sitting down and figuring out how do I get along in this society is one way to go at it that's completely different from my perspective from saying that really isn't the issue. The issue is what does my creator want of me? And that just puts us on a very different wavelength. Yeah. And a lot of people can feel guilty like, oh, what my creator wants of me must be to be a missionary in the poorest area of, you know, Africa or, or what have you, and there's no doubt that people are called to ver those very things. Uh, but usually the sign of a calling is it, it really does light you up inside. It's something you deeply want to do. So in a sense, what God is asking of us is to do something that we most want to do on those more deeper levels. You know, I can say, well, I, I really want you know, a nice house, but do I want that as much as having a meaningful engagement on this planet as I walk through? Now, the conversation you had about Paul saying that he couldn't, he couldn't uh, contain himself from speaking about this convergence that he had, uh, the callings for folks on, on their career paths, mm -hmm. are they always that flamboyant that you can't contain yourself, or is it a sense of calling? I'm thinking that convergence itself is a sense that we have, that things are changing. A right. deep satisfaction, that's right. And it seems to be moving in a direction that we can recognize, that we can see the patterns moving. So convergence itself is its own kind of calling, is it not? Yeah, and it provokes this deep intuition. Um, I uh, just recently uh, was at a meeting of, of a number of people who were trying to kind of came together in Washington, D.C., leaders from across denominations, I mean, denominations that who would literally never... Uh, gathered before as a whole to say how can we work together because we really think we can uh, across the theological spectrum. I've never seen such a wide variety of people and backgrounds from Pentecostal to to uh, UCC and, and everything in between and everybody sitting around saying we have this very deep intuition that things have changed and that, that, that I can work very productively with you even though we used to not talk talk at all and then you say well okay well describe that and people are like, wow. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's kind of wild. It reminds me actually of a book that was written back in the 6th century called The Cloud of Unknowing by a, a mystic who said, the closer we pull to God actually, uh, the more just kind of we don't know, we feel like we don't know anything. And that's exactly the feeling of that meeting. Um, it was, we feel very, very, very close to God. Well, describe that, <laughs> but completely tongue-tied, but, but, but the deep intuition. Uh, is, is certainly there. That's the way it also works oftentimes when we're sensing our calling in life. Um, uh, the sense of what's the next best, it's not that we all have a permanent college like, oh, be a, a teacher at you know, a third grade at this school and there's what you're supposed to do. You know, these things can evolve and change over time, but we really do when, we, when, when push comes to shove, oftentimes our mental mind, our logic has to catch up with what we already know. And we're afraid to act on that because we can't quite put it into a logical framework that other people understand and we feel a bit tongue-tied but we know deep down that that's you know where the calling lies and with that calling comes the 
ability to open the conversation and expand who we are as people so that we are, in fact, <coughs> empowered to move toward closer to God so that we have that much more strength in, in our convictions about where we're heading and where we might see that pillar in the desert we talked yeah. about once. Yeah, are you enthusiastic about people who love their work? Yes. I mean, it's catching. You yeah. can feel it. Yeah. Well, now that you're here, I'm feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I didn't get that yeah, from you. I was say, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Different but, kind yeah, of yeah, contagion. Yeah. Different but, kind of contagion. But your, your point about empowerment is an important one, I think, that whenever God calls... Uh, there's also an empowering. God never calls us to something that we're not also empowered to right. follow through on. God doesn't just set, set, up, set us up to push us over a cliff. Sometimes it feels that way. <laughs> but we are always uh, empowered to, to, to follow that, that calling. So it, to me, it, and this take, oftentimes it takes years to develop this level of trust mm -hmm. uh, in that very thing. But you do learn to trust that I can't, I can't see how I could possibly achieve X, Y, or Z you know, and, and, and really you can't if you're just trying to operate on your own energies. It's always like you can achieve X, Y, or Z in conversation, relationship with spirit or with God. Because uh, God has a much bigger picture than, than we do of our, of our context. And, and we pick up on the, that, that sight through in, intuitively. Uh, but um, it's harder to just simply put on in a book, here's the seven steps to following your calling. Yeah. I think the first time we come into our calling, our first reaction is, this is ridiculous. I couldn't possibly do this. I mean, yeah. Moses said, I'm supposed to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, what? <laughs> yeah. And God always has to say, I didn't tell you you were going alone. I'm coming with you. Yeah. Last week um, in our conversation, Bruce was saying that um, when I asked, how do you know whether you're in the right call or not? Bruce said, it's like asking, how do you know whether you're in love? Mm -hmm. If you have to ask, then you're not. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Good, good. So point. there, if yeah. we're if talking care about what intuition, thinks about it. You yeah. haven't got it yeah. yet. <laughs> this has been just the, a most fascinating conversation. You know, I just wanted to add one, one thing, more though. thing. I've never, in all my years of helping people find their calling, I've never found a single person who felt worthy of their calling. Uh, you know, to me, is that's almost a sign of calling itself. If you feel worthy of it, then it's probably not your calling. <laughs> yeah. And if you can do it without the help of God, which is the yeah. same thing, then right. it's not a calling. That empowerment. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas on vocation and convergence. And we'll uh, come back to another point of convergence next week and continue our conversation. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Thank you for the one great music and the to go with our conversation. I want to say a special thank you to Morris Jones, who is back with us this week doing the administrative chat. Yay! Uh, there's going to be lots of opportunity to be talking to Morris on chat, so I hope you'll take advantage of that as we move into our worship as the second half of our show continues. Uh, but I want to remind you that next week we'll be continuing our conversation on convergence with Bruce Race Chow. He is a Presbyterian minister who's written all kinds of fun stuff. He's a blogger. He was on Animate Faith series done by Sparkhouse. Our own Eric Elness was on Animate Faith in the Bible series, right? So that's how I got introduced to Bruce, and I'm really looking forward to him. He's got several books out. Uh, the one that I think is hysterical is called, let me see, But I Don't See You as an Asian. How's that for a book conversation? It's about conversations on race. So we're looking forward to have Bruce Race Childs with us next week, and I hope that you'll be with us to join us in our conversation. And we'll be right back to our worship series, uh, to our worship part of our show tonight, uh, which Eric Elness will lead for us, as well as a special treat where... Um, celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. 
uh, day this week, and Eric has uh, an, um, an amazing way of um, reciting the part of I Have a Dream speech, and that will be coming up in the second part of our show, too. So stick around for that. But first we have our musical feature from our Bruce Brothers. Matt? Thanks, Chris. I want to introduce the fellows very quickly. On the piano, Mr. Matt Amandis, Carlos Figueroa on the drums, and Steve Gomez on the bass. And we're going to do Lift Every Voice and Sing. Here comes the fabulous Carol Rogers. Carol Rogers, wonderful. Thank you, Carol and Bruce Brothers. Well, now we're going to return again to our uh, central uh, Numa passage for the evening in, from the book of Ephesians. Uh, and, and this will commence our contemplative portion of the program. Now, uh, we have changed the format. If you haven't been around for Darkwood Brew, at Darkwood Brew for a little while, we've changed the format. We are trying to do 
our talk well and our contemplative stuff well. And so we've kind of made a, more of a separation and lengthened out then what we're doing contemplatively. We realize this is a challenge when we're coming to you across of a flat, a flat screen, but we've been delighted with the feedback thus far when uh, people have been able to be in a quieter place and actually followed through on what we're kind of guiding you through. Um, we keep getting messages about profound experiences, so we think we're on to, to something uh, here. And we ask that simply if you haven't tried this before, just give it a little trust. You may be watching this as a recorded episode even, but if you'll simply set aside a little bit of time now uh, and follow the guidance, um, not trying to analyze it overly, but just simply fall into it, just give it a try. Oftentimes uh, it creates quite productive uh, terrain. So first we're going to hear the Numa passage and we are asking that you simply pay attention to what sticks in your mind. What is left over when that passage is, is, is through? Is there a word or a phrase that sticks for you? And this will come up later in our contemplative time. So pay attention. You don't have to know why it's stuck in your mind at all. You simply note what did stick. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. And we simply invite you to take a deep breath in, let it out slowly. You may want to bring your eyes into soft focus or simply close them as we'll be in contemplative mode for the next uh, uh, many minutes, about the next 10. Um, but simply take that word or phrase first and let it turn around in your mind. Consider the different ways that, that you see that word or phrase touching your life. Now our object will be to simply settle down a little bit more deeply inside ourselves as we've been doing this last couple of weeks. We'll be moving towards thoughts that may help uh, open you to a sense of your own calling in life. So first, as we've done before, a picture in your mind's eye that you're surrounded by something that keeps you perfectly safe. 
I personally envision myself within a glass ball. It sounds bizarre. Don't worry about what it is. So long as you can feel it in yourself, that you are protected from the outside, any kind of outside negative influence, arrows that get slung at you, here you are safe. Find that space within yourself. Now we're going to move one step deeper. This will sound similar in certain respects, but find now a place. Perhaps if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you've already found that place. Inside your safe is yourself where you are absolutely safe and free, not only of all external negativity, but you're free even from your internal voices. You're free from your own judgments. You're even free from God's judgment. It is a place of perfect safety. Picture that place and feel it within you. Be there. Now from within the safety and security of this place, you are not constrained by any financial problems in this space within yourself. You are not needing to react to any social pressures within this place. You're not even asking what is right and what is wrong. Now, simply engage for a few moments. Ask yourself, what would you do with your energies? Is if you could take where you are now in that perfect safety and be free to do that, this thing, in the outside world, not worrying about finances, social pressures, even what's right or wrong, it's just simply doing what is it that truly your deepest desire is to do. Engage in some fantasy for a moment.
Now, remember that phrase or that word that occurred to you in the Numa reading. How does that word or phrase interact with your fantasy? What word may it speak to you? Now, before we enter a time where we engage in the act of and ritual of communion, which will bring our con contemplation to an end, can just simply ask your, or offer thanks to God for that which you can be thankful for in the last 24 to 48 hours. What has happened in your life that you have not yet offered thanks for? We invite you to simply take a deep breath in, let it out slowly, and in so doing, remain present in this act of communion. The Numa phrase that really stuck out for me had to do with God being in all and through all, just shot through everything. And as I reflected about on my own path, my sweet spot, my sense of call, um, that's really what it feels like, where when you're in that sense of your sweet spot, all of life starts to speak to you. It, it connects you, it converges in you know, all kinds of aspects of life, not just the ones that are formally related to your own vocation. And what I also find in the area of my own sweet spot or call, that this act of communion, this ritual that Jesus partake, took of on the night of betrayal and desertion always seems to speak to me in a new way 
about where I'm placing my energies and how I'm placing my energies within that sense of call. So perhaps tonight, if you happen to have juice or crackers or bread and wine available and care to, to participate with us, uh, you yourself will ask regarding that, that place that you found within you in that safe spot what you would like to do or be doing or what you are doing. How does this ritual speak to you in that place? As we remember, Jesus taking bread, breaking it, saying, my friends, this is my body, and it's broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. So likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection. And we come to know that even the deepest, darkest places in our lives are not absent from the presence of God. The deep within our darkest of darkest places, there is a presence for whom darkness is not dark, but is as light as day. And in our very endings, within that presence, there is always a new beginning. The gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to share the feast.
Well, this time we want to, uh, before concluding our program, uh, simply take your comments or questions from uh, either the internet and the coffee house. And uh, I did notice as I, we were kind of coming out of this, uh, one of our viewers, uh, Teresa, said, uh, put in the comment, uh, maybe not feeling pulled to somewhere else means I'm in the right place. And that's a really good thing to ask, ask uh, any, any of us. Uh, you may not have been felt pulled to a different place. And well, then I would ask, well, maybe I am truly in that place where my energies needs to, need to be uh, at this time. Especially if you, if you have not felt that pull and you felt that safety. You, you could do anything. You, you're not needing uh, to, to go anywhere or to satisfy anyone. You could just simply be whoever you want to be. If you're not feeling pulled, that's a good sign to say, you know, maybe I need to continue to develop the direction I'm, I'm at. Well, uh, Morris, well, did you find anything, uh, any, uh, any comments or questions from the, the internet before we uh, move on? There was one uh, question uh, from the internet from Ian, Eric, Bruce, uh, directed to both of you. Question from Ian, um, what does the future role of pastors look like uh, in, within the church? How will churches organize differently? Yep. Bruce, you want to? It looks like a big confused mess. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, I think things are scattering in so many creative and wonderful new directions that, uh, that really many things are up for grabs and many new kinds of communities will be forming and I think pastors in the future will have uh, patterns, designs, gifts that we can't, thought of, can't really imagine yet in lots and lots of ways. But the frustrating part of it is, how do you get ready? Hmm. And that's I think a lot of what Bangor's thinking about. How do you get ready to train pastors for a future when you don't know what it looks like? Yeah. You know, I was just at a conference last week on convergence that was uh, part of a, a United Church of Christ gathering of uh, uh, ministers from large churches, and the, the subject, the gathering subject was on convergence, and Brian McLaren and uh, Diana Butler Bass uh, were there, and one of the things that Brian said, encouraged the ministers is to, he said, uh, reduce your job functions down to the very minimum you can do to get by. Uh, you, how far can you get them down before you know, like your congregation will kick you out? <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, and maintain that, do that, but also then to use that extra time simply to do whatever you feel like you want to do. Have fun. Do what, what is bringing you alive that, that may not be satisfied in your your work environment at the, at the time. Now he wasn't simply saying this because he thought, hey, you guys ought to slack off. He actually was saying this because uh, he does not think enough ministers are spending that time and energy discovering their own fine tuning, their own sense of call. And if they are not doing that, um, they're not helping their congregations do that either. And in this time, so many things are changing so fast. We need that extra free space in our brains, in our hearts in order to simply uh, interact with our environments in ways that trigger insights that, that, that do bring us closer to our, our true, true energies. I think sometimes it's helpful to me to think of things that are familiar. For instance, when I think of, uh, of the Apostle Paul, maybe let's say three years before the Damascus Road, and someone's asking him, how do you get ready for the ministry that's coming? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I mean, he's a rabbinical student studying hard as he can knows how, you know, the scriptures, and he's in Jerusalem, and he, he thinks that the path is all really clear because everybody's been walking it, and it's familiar, but how's he going to get ready for Corinth, or Philippi, or Ephesus three years before it happens? His only hope is to be tuned to the Spirit. Yeah. I think that's the part that's still true. Yeah. Yeah, the area of strategic planning, I think, is, is long gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there really should be strategic listening. Uh, I just lost my crystal ball. What do I do? <laughs> That's right, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Ian, for the, for the, the comment. Uh, any others before Wonderful. we? Wonderful. All right, great. 
Well, uh, every year on uh, Martin Luther King um, weekends, um, I make as a personal practice for about the last 20 to rememorize uh, that famous portion of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And for about the last 17 years, I've presented that uh, just because I've, since I've memorized it already, I invited others if they want to, um, to listen again. And as a way of closing the episode, uh, I want to offer that speech uh, to you now as the, as the final blessing. Uh, and just a reminder, next week we'll be looking forward to uh, hearing from Bruce Reyes Chow. Uh, he, Bruce has always got a, a unique point of view, interesting point of view, oftentimes funny, uh, but also deep. So looking forward to uh, Bruce joining us next week. My friends, despite the present difficulties and frustrations of the moment, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Oh convergence. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a desert state sweltering with the heat of injustice and oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of brotherhood and freedom. I have a dream that one day my four little children will grow up in a nation where they are not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day the state of Alabama, whose governor's lips are presently dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, will be transformed into a situation where little black boys and black girls may join hands with little white boys and white girls and walk together as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places shall be made plain, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith which, with which I return to the South. With this faith we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing we will be free one day. That will be the day when all God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous peaks of California. Let freedom ring from Stone Mountain in Tennessee and Lookout Mountain, Mountain in Georgia. Let freedom ring from every hill and every molehill in Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when we let freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing together in the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you.